when I was a kid, I would sit in my bedroom and I would play along to the radio for hours. Even if I was supposed to practice something for band or Arbens or whatever, you know, I was like, man, I had more fun just picking out harmonies and playing along with 80s, 80s music. Could, whatever came on the radio, I didn't care. You know, and I remembered, I guess just because of COVID and the situation, you're reflecting back on, on life and you're doing a lot of self-discovery. I did a lot of reading. Um, and I was like, man, that was some, that was happy times when I was a kid in that bedroom playing along. So I applied that to TikTok and I said, you know what? I don't care if it's corny. I don't care if it's, if people think that it's cheesy, I'm going to add horns to songs that don't have horns. Warning. This episode contains adult language and adult humor. Since when have trumpet players ever been considered adults? If you are easily offended by these types of conversations, consider switching to the oboe. Welcome to the Trumpet Guru Sang Podcast. I'm your host, Jose Johnson. My guest for this episode is Jay Webb. Jay is the epitome of a well-rounded player. As equally at home on the stage with the National Symphony Orchestra as he is throwing down the funk with Corey Wong, Jay's trumpet playing made him a mainstay in New Orleans, Philly, and New York. But it's his viral work on TikTok and his upcoming Doc Severinsen tribute band that will lead Jay to global trumpet domination. So, pour yourself a big glass, pull up a chair, and let the hang begin. Welcome to this episode of the Trumpet Gurus Hang Podcast, and I am joined by Mr. Jay Webb. Here's Jay. What's up, man? What's happening, man? Good to see you. Oh, it is so good to see you. Um, so, a little bit of uh, Trumpet Gurus Hang trivia. Uh, Jay was actually uh, one of the first people that I interviewed. This was back before I realized that I was going to be doing video. Uh, having to do uh, all of these things uh, during this wonderful COVID pandemic remotely. And uh, Jay was a live, a live session. So the little, little scene, and actually never seen episode three, <laughs> which is only available on the audio podcast, but I definitely wanted to get Jay on so everyone could uh, enjoy looking at his beautiful face. If you haven't, <laughs> If you haven't seen him on TikTok, uh, he is a he is a wonderful star of uh, stage, screen, and um, many other things. So uh, let's talk, Jay, about what you've been up to since the last time I seen you. Oh man, that's quite the introduction. First of all, I don't, I'm not sure how to handle all that. <laughs> <laughs> and just roll with it. Have a drink. Um, yeah, uh, it's been interesting, you know, since the pandemic, and especially since the last time we hung out and spoke. Um, you know, the world has changed. The industry has changed, um, you know, for all musicians around the globe. Um, you know, so yeah, I've been doing a ton of social media, um, TikTok, Instagram, and, uh, mostly because for my own sanity, uh, you know, and if anything other than that, it's just been, you know, to keep my, um, productivity up and my creativity and an outlet to just sort of do my thing. And, and surprisingly, it's kind of blown up. <laughs> well, you know, that's a good thing. That's a real good thing because I mean, you were, you were hella busy uh, before the pandemic. I was really, I was, you know, I like to think that it was, I was on a, 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 a really a severe uptick in my career. You know, I was, a lot of things were happening. I was, playing with a lot of different artists, covering a lot of different genres. Um, you know, I'd just come off a 10 year stint with a tour that I did um, featuring the guys from Jersey Boys. And then, you know, it sort of started to steer into different avenues and, you know, started touring with pop artists and funk artists and getting called to do the, the National Symphony. And, um, you know, and, I, and, and I, you know, I had been booked on more symphony shows, you know, and then all of that just got wiped out by the, by the pandemic. So it just sort of pulled the rug out from all of us. Um, but yeah, it was, it was shocking and disappointing. I have to say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was like, no one was expecting it. 
And even when uh, when it started to happen, you know, like, eh, okay, well, you know, maybe maybe a month, maybe two months, and you know, here we are a year in, and and, and we're finally just getting to the point where st- things are starting to open up. So, um, I mean, what's what's it looking like for you? You know, coming in the coming months. I mean, I have very few things on the books. I have uh, a wedding gig, I think next Sunday, which was, had been postponed. This is the third time it's been pushed out. Yeah. You know, and that's, I've done maybe three weddings this entire time. I actually had a gig on new, on new year's Eve. I flew out to Arizona and had a gig and then did one private party in Florida since so you know a handful of gigs in an entire year yeah you know on my books I, I don't even think about it i look at my calendar and it's just it's just empty you know there's like one one here maybe in the next few months there'll be a couple you know i'm really hoping that you know in the summer months things start to open up a little bit more and and we see some things going on but i honestly i i can't even tell you, you could count them on on Three fingers, the amount of gigs I have booked right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, you know, it's certainly the same, same boat. Things are starting to open up, you know, um, weddings primarily. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's about it. Uh, but hey, I'm not going to complain. You know, when they, when they roll in, I'm not, I'm not going to be bitching about it because I just want to get out and start playing again. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the thing, you know, uh, I, and I think the wedding band, industry is going to be the first thing to come back club club bands club dates um you know eventually broadway but you know i was i'm just a sub on broadway i I don't have a show so you know there's a lot of guys in line that had shows that are just itching to get back into something so that's that's going to be a while for us broadway sub musicians to Mm -hmm. get back into that circle so you really can't even i don't even think about it because it just doesn't exist right now you know so yeah, I you know I was just um, checking out some news about uh, some experiments that they've been doing. Uh, I forget where, was it in Sweden with um, with doing live shows, mm-hmm. and they uh, they did like a, a five hundred person show to start out with, and you know everybody had to, you know, you bought your ticket it was like twenty five bucks or something like that, and you got a uh, rapid COVID COVID test, and you you know had this app and. You had to take the test, and if you were, you know, positive, tested positive, well, you got a refund. And if you tested negative, you know, you went there and you had to wear your mask, and there's 500 people, and there's some social distancing. Um, so they did that first one, and they had they tracked everybody for two weeks, and there were zero cases. So. So there are zero cases uh, tied into it. Now they were doing, I think it was like last week or something like that, they were doing another one where it was going to be a 5,000 uh, 5, person capacity. So it's the same thing, but obviously there's not going to be any social distancing involved. So it's just going to be do the test, wear your mask, go into the concert, and then they're going to track you for two weeks. So it'll be interesting to see how that that turns out because if if there's – uh, you know, good results from that, then it's going to give people a lot more confidence about getting out and getting into the shows. And that's what I was going to say. It's, it's about, you know, it's about consumer confidence. It's about, you know, the, the, the audience and if they feel comfortable putting themselves at risk in, in a small confined area, just like Broadway theaters, you know, that's people, when are they going to buy tickets? When are they going to feel comfortable to be in those situations? I mean, it's going to be really hard to tell that until you attempt to open a show and see how it goes. Yeah. Well, speaking of being in small places, it looks like uh, you're in timeout. You're in the detention room, your own padded cell. A four by seven whisper room. <laughs> so that is the most interesting looking thing. And I, I got to get the backstory on this. So, okay. So, um, I started doing TikToks. Um, Lexi Signor, uh, you know her, great trumpet player, great educator. Um, she said, you got to get on TikTok. You got to do TikToks. And I, I watched the videos. I'm like, I don't get it. This isn't funny to me. What, I, what am I going to do? She's right. like, do your thing, play trumpet. I'm like, ah, really? People are, they're not going to. Anyway, long story short, I did a couple of videos. Um, and... And 
all of a sudden it just it sort of blew, it blew up. Um, I got I got a couple of vi viral videos as the kids say they went viral coming up on people's for you pages. You know, my daughter's calling me, dad, you're coming up on my friends for you pages. What are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. I'm just posting trumpet stuff, whatever. So it became this thing where I had 25 followers and within two weeks, I had 25,000. Holy hell. And then from there, it went to 50,000. From there, it went to 100,000. Now I'm at 152,000 with 3.4 million likes on my videos overall. Wow. And a couple of videos have gone, have gone like over 1 million views, you know, 8,000, 10,000 hours of view time. I mean, it's just insane. So I was in my apartment doing this, obviously. And, you know, my neighbors were very kind and, and uh, understanding because I'm a trumpet player. It's what I do for a living and I'm, I'm going to practice. And I'm going to play. I don't have any el anywhere else to do it. Um, until one morning, I got a note on my door that said, please finish practicing your instrument by 8 p.m. And I said, well, that's not going to fly uh, because now, I, now I'm at the point where I have to provide content. You know, right. it's like, and, and then on top of that, which we can talk about later, I started getting calls to do recording sessions for other TikTok artists and collaborating. So I said, you know what, I, I have to do something. I'm either going to build something or I'm going to purchase a practice room. So I called up the fine folks at Whisper Room, told them what I was doing, what I needed it for. And uh, they were great. They just said, we know exactly what you need. Um, I had it shipped. I, had, I got a day job. Um, so I had it shipped to where I work because it, it came on a semi. Okay. <laughs> It had to be forklifted off of a truck. And then I, I rented a U-Haul. I put all the boxes in the U-Haul and I, it came in 35 boxes. 35. And, and it weighs 1,800 pounds. And you so, carry that all by yourself because I know you get those big bulging biceps. I, I know. Oh, man. Yeah. All those years of holding up trumpets. Exactly. Um. And so I, I built the majority of it by myself. I had a friend come over and help me put on uh, the, the roof. And then there's a lid that goes on top of it, which that weighs, it's a four by seven sheet that weighs 90 pounds. So I had to get that up because it's seven feet. It's four foot by seven feet by seven feet tall. And uh, I got to tell you though, it is the best investment I have ever made because, you know, it can be disassembled and it can be moved. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's a really great product. It's, I, I can't, I mean, I'm going to give them a plug for sure. Whisper Room has been great. And I, I, I appreciate everything that they've done for me. It was, it's a life, lifesaver, really, honestly. All right. Well, I'll make sure I put a, a link to them uh, in the notes, the show notes here. So if people want to check it out, because I mean, that's always the hardest thing. Um, I mean, I've always had a phobia about people hearing me practice. Oh, interesting. And that's just always bugged me. And, and I don't like practicing when people are around, you know, like if, if uh, anybody's in the house, don't want to practice. If, if, I, if my neighbors are home, I really don't want to that much either, you know, shut the windows, even if it's like a hundred degrees, you know, it's like, I just, I just don't want people to hear me. Um, but it's, you can't always do that. And especially, you know, when you, you have other obligations and the only time you can practice is at, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night or whatever, what are you going to do? Right. So, Right. And that, and that was a challenge because then, so then I get into, uh, you know, people messaging me and following me on Instagram and then inboxing me say, Hey, I'd love to play you to play on this track, blah, blah, blah. And, um, so honestly, I've done more recording in this last year than I have done in my entire career. No kidding. I have been on, I've had, I did a track with a guy based out of Huntsville, Alabama, um, that went, in, in a matter of hours, went to number one on iTunes for a singer-songwriter. I, I, I never had anything like that happen. And here, I, here we are in like basically the, the worst period of my career, and I'm doing more recording and being exposed uh, to, more, to different, more opportunities than I have been. Yeah. It, you know, it's it's so that's like, the, I guess, the silver lining of of if there's one good thing that came out of this, it's that I've learned how to produce. I've learned how to record myself. 
um, and and good quality, you know, recordings and things. And and it's definitely helped. And the and a majority of these are paid sessions. These people, and they're and a lot of them are young. They're in their twenties, mm-hmm. um, you know. And they're just like, "What's your fee?" Are you tell them your fee. Okay, well, I got it. And they're paid. They're paid recording sessions. Hey, with with you know, un virtually unknown people from all around the world. I've I've I I currently just recorded with a young guy uh, from the UK who's about to release a song on this on the sixteenth. Um, I recorded uh, another single with an artist uh, based out of Quebec. Another guy in Seattle, Hunts or um, uh, Huntsville, Alabama. I mean, I, I've lost track of the amount of artists that I've done. Yeah. And I think back and go, wait, who did? Oh, yeah, I had that. You know, so, yeah, this room has been essential for that because where else would I have done it? Because I do it at 12 o'clock in the in the morning. Yeah. You know, and I just I'm in here and I come out sometimes like, oh, God, it's dark. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I, I mean, it, it's I'm, I'm a firm believer that, you know, it, adversity it it allows you or allows us some people um to rethink and reshape and come up with creative solutions you know when when it's the same old same old you know you you, you get what you get but i think you know, as as much as this time sucked i mean it's, i certainly would not want to have this happen that i would never wish this to happen and i, I hope it never happens again in my lifetime yeah. however um you know there are a lot of things that a lot of good that that has come out of this because it forced people to start thinking and doing things differently. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, and, and then there are the people that, that didn't do that, unfortunately, and, and, and just sit and go, okay, I'm going to, I'm just going to wait it out. I'm going to wait it out. Things are going to go back to normal. And then, like you said before, here we are a year, almost a year and a half now into this thing and nothing's changed. You know, so if you have to reinvent yourself, what else are you going to do? How are you going to do it? How are you going to create, uh, be creative? How are you going to do recording sessions? You know, they're, they're out there. People are still recording. Um, it's just majority of it is, is remote. And so what, how are you going to do that? How are you going to promote yourself? And for me, it was, it was sort of an unexpected result of me going on TikTok. You know, I never thought that anything other than just me having a creative outlet to do whatever I wanted. Um, and then it was just the residual of that. Here come these recording sessions. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's great. And, and, you know, exposure is a major part of the business, you know, uh, you know, getting your name out there. And as, as the landscape shifts, I mean, even without COVID, uh, things were starting to shift towards more remote recording and, and things like that. Um, and if you weren't willing to take those chances, then, you know, and invest in the equipment to do it at home, learn how to do these things. And uh, you're, you're behind and you have to, you have to play catch up to, to stay in the game. And I think with more and more young people doing things like the you other know, TikTok stuff, uh, I mean, you just got to stay on top of the technology because technology does certainly drive the the consumer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny because I, you know, we, we were talking about just, you know, creative outlet and, and, and uh, just having a platform to just sort of get out there and, and still perform, you know, because we can't do it in, in person. And so, you know, I, I used to do Facebook lives all the time on my gigs, you know, and, and have yeah. people you know, and then bring, bring, you know, gigs to, to, into people's living rooms, family, friends, whatever fans that couldn't make it to a show, they'd watch you online and comment and, you know, and, and yes, we still had the technology to do that, but now as we were, you know, one man band or one man, you know, you know, one person band. And so like, for me, um, I, I looked at TikTok as like an opportunity to, do what I wanted to do. Um, and I tell people this all the time. I go, you know, some, some people are on TikTok to, to get that notoriety, to get noticed, to build their career. And I just felt that at that point in time, when I started that, I, I was, I didn't need to show off. I didn't need to do anything to get, to get noticed. So 
I used TikTok as an opportunity to do what I wanted to do. And so when I was a kid, I would sit in my bedroom and I would play along to the radio for hours. Even if I was supposed to practice something for band or Arbens or whatever, you know, I was like, man, I had more fun just picking out harmonies and playing along with 80s, 80s music, Could, whatever came on the radio. Right. I didn't care, you know, and I remembered, I guess just because of COVID and the situation, you're reflecting back on, on life and you're doing a lot of self-discovery. I did a lot of reading um, and I was like, man, that was some that was happy times when I was a kid in that bedroom playing along. So I applied that to TikTok. And I said, you know what? I don't care if it's corny. I don't care if it's if people think that it's cheesy. I'm going to add horns to songs that don't have horns. Okay, and, yeah. And, I, and I'm going to do arrangements on it because it's what I want to do and it makes me happy. And that, w- when I started doing that, that's when things just started to explode. And I did a video on a One Direction tune and, and I had heard of One Direction. I've never listened to them until I got on TikTok. And I was like, oh, these guys are really, these, this production is really good. It's, it's good stuff. But man, it, it would sound so much better if it had horns on All it. Right. So I put horns on it. And then I must have done two months of One Direction tunes. And it just went crazy. And so now everybody knows me as like this, like they, they call me Trumpet Man or Trumpet King on tiktok because i just do all these horn arrangements but for me it wasn't i didn't need the notoriety i didn't need the 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 acclaim it was just i'm just doing it because it's fun yeah makes me happy and it just sort of turned into this thing which then created all these other opportunities um for me and and it and it's still i'm like just before you called i was doing another session um for another nashville guy like he sort of sounds like michael buble 50s vibe um i'm working on that then i have another thing i have to work on you know later tonight and it's just it's kept me busy my mind busy musically uh you know it's financially of course i'm not where i once was any of us were as far as the music industry but as far as your sanity and keeping you motivated uh, to practice and to play on a daily basis, man, it's, I, I'm not exaggerating when I say it's been an absolute lifesaver. You know, people rag on TikTok all the time. It's for kids, blah, 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 blah. And like I said, I was apprehensive about it. I didn't want to go on it. Yeah. You know, but now I, I can't imagine my life without having to make that decision. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what it would be like. That's cool. I, and I think the most important thing you said, and, and you've said it a few times, is, you know, the the getting back to, to what brought you joy. And I know so many guys that I've talked to during this pandemic, both trumpet players and, and just people in other areas of life um, that have talked about, you know, how they had to go back and reestablish and reevaluate you know, what it is in life that they're really trying to accomplish and and what are the things that made them happy? Because, you know, when the things that go away that you think make you happy, like being able to go out to a bar or go out to a restaurant or go to see a movie, you know, that stuff goes away and and you, you miss it. But ultimately you realize, no, that's, that, that can't be all there is that makes me happy. What is it that really makes me happy? And, and a lot of times it's going back to your past and figuring out those those little things, you know, the things you did as a kid, because those are the things that didn't cost money because you didn't have any money to spend. So, you know, when you can get back to that, it's like, OK, you, you, you kind of recenter yourself and reestablish your 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 true north, your north star. And then that's, I think, when creativity really starts to skyrocket because you're, you're coming from your heart. And as a musician, I mean, that's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be about joy and, and emotion. Yes, absolutely. I, I agree with you a hundred percent there. Um, you know, and that's a, as an artist, as a trumpet player, as a performer, um, that is something that I've always, that I always think about when I'm playing, whether, I, whether I'm creating a horn arrangement whether I'm soloing, I'm always thinking about the emotional part of it. How much emotion can I put into the playing? How much feel 
can I put in? You know, I want to, I want to tug at people's heartstrings. I want them. I want to make that emotional connection with people. And I've done projects where it's just, it's just not there, you know, but when, but when you do something and you listen back to it, I mean, I have to be honest with you. I'll be, I, and, and everybody's going to hear this. Um, there are moments when I'm playing something it, like a first take, I will emotionally sob where I can't even play. I, I just, I shake and I lose, I lose everything. I can't, I have to stop playing. And then I take a deep breath and, and I go, man, you know, you just, you're overwhelmed with emotion mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, your heart beats out of your chest or you just, you know, and, and, and it's, it's not necessarily a sad moment. It's, it's, it's a, a happy, it could be whatever, but there are moments when I do, I have those, those, those moments. And, um, you know, that's when I, okay, I take a deep breath. I go, all right. <laughs> I kind of giggle to myself and go, all right, okay. This, you're, you're, you're hitting the right nerve here. And then I go back and do the second take and it's, it's what I want to play and I'm able to get through it. And then I listen back to it and I'm just, I'm happy with the way it comes out. And I know that in that first take, if I'm putting that much heart and soul into it, when people listen to it, I know that someone out there somewhere is going to feel that same emotional connection to what I played and what I laid down on the track. And that's really, really important to me. And I have to say that it's happened more and more often during this pandemic and in, in, in this, this booth and in this room than it's ever happened in my entire life. Mm-hmm. I would have one or two moments like that. You know, we've all had it when we're on stage, but man, it's just, I think it's because we've had time to reflect and sort of, you know, uh, learning more about ourselves because we have time to do that. And if you take the time to do it, you can really connect with that inner self and, um, man, and you just, you can get that across to other people. It's just, you really tap into that whole, that whole, um, energy, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you, man. Yeah, that 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 is so cool when that happens. I mean, I I have certainly had moments where where I've been uh, soloing and and uh, the audience starts to cry, but it's it's usually not because it was so good. It's just like, man, I paid to see this shit. I don't know about that. <laughs> I call I call BS on that. <laughs> well, you know, it, 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 it it's a it's a gift. What can I say? It's a gift. <laughs> so. Um, you know, when, um, I, I know that, that things have, you know, I, I certainly want to talk about TikTok, TikTok, TikTok a little bit more, cause I mean, it's something I don't know that much about, but you know, I don't want to, I want to, you know, beat it too much right now, but I kind of want to, uh, go back to, uh, what we had talked about last time we were together and you were, you had a big project that was coming up and obviously it got, uh, somewhat derailed because of COVID, but I think that, uh, you've still got some things going on with your, uh, Doc Severance, Doc Severance and tribute. So, uh, yeah, what's going on with that, man? I, I'm really excited to hear, hear what's going on. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately it's been on the back burner, um, because you know, what else can you do with it? Because we're at, we were at the point where, you know, I was scheduling a video shoot to put the promo package together. And obviously that just got completely derailed. Um, we had recorded, you know, three demos that came out really well. And then, you know, you can see that people can see those on my website and stuff. Um, you know, and I, I still, I'm now starting to sort of, I've got things in place. Um, I just actually la- uh, launched a Patreon to do some behind the scenes things for different, uh, different levels. Um, it, some of the levels are really funny. I, that's like the fourth trumpet player is the introductory level. And then third trombone, a second tenor. It, it's, it's kind of fun. Yeah, you got um, Pete Barbuti in there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you said, yeah, he got, I mean, how can you not put Pete Barbuti in there? <laughs> Um, so yeah, I launched that yesterday. I, I've been, I was holding on to it, holding on to it. And because I wanted to put up a video of the band and ex- really explain what was going on and, and, and how we were going to do the show. And, uh, obviously never got to that point. So I said, you know what, I want to start sort of promoting it little by little and start getting it back, you know, back in the public eye and, and start talking about it again. 
And now that I've also built this, this new fan base to a whole other genre and generation, um, or generation of, of, of fans and followers, now I think is the time to start pushing it and promoting it. So yes, I have a show. It's the Doc Severinsen Tribute Band. I've taken Doc solos from the Tonight Show Band era and I've transcribed them meticulously <laughs> Um, and eventually we'll have a transcription book of these solos. I have three, three or four of them that are, that are basically, um, edited and ready to go, but I have a, a ton more that I haven't finished. Um, and they are note for note, phrase for phrase of what doc plays on those albums. And, and, um, it's a passion of mine since I was a very, very small child to do this, to be, Doc Severinsen. And, um, you know, I've studied his playing for so many years and, and, um, you know, I really think that it's, it's going to be a good show. It's going to be a fun show. And I think people are really going to enjoy it. And hopefully people will say, wow, he sounds just like Doc and I can't tell the difference. That's my goal. <laughs> That's the goal. It's good to have goals, Jay. It's really good. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, so I'm really hoping to get that back, back up and going. Um, like I said, the Patreon launch is the first step of really getting it out there and hopefully getting some, some funding to come in. Cause I had some funding ori originally to do the three tracks, um, and some promotional stuff as far as just, um, you know, uh, producing and things like that. So this is, you know, the, the public's chance to have, you know, a little bit of control and, 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 and help out and be a part of the project and, and the process. So yeah. we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm excited about it, man. I, I know that that's been, um, you know, big thing for you and, uh, that you, you put a lot of time and energy into it. So, uh, hopefully as things open up that, that tour will get going and you'll come rolling through Lancaster and I can, uh, hang out with you and then say, yeah, I, I, I know, I know the guy here. <laughs> I know maybe, the guy. Maybe I'll get in on that fourth trumpet book or something. Yeah. You <laughs> hire me. There you go, man. Yeah. And if you know that we're talking about, please uh, just go on YouTube and, uh, and, and search for uh, Pete Barbuti, uh fourth trumpet. Oh. You know, you know, my son. So when we were quarantined, my son, I did a bunch of YouTube videos with him and we had nothing but time on our hands. So I produced a bunch of videos and he actually recreated the whole skit and oh. it's, and it's on YouTube. So there's my like seven year old son doing all the moves and counting the band off and does the whole skit. It's hilarious. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. That, <laughs> that, that is a classic for certain, for certain. So, uh, I mean, let, let's uh let's go back to this this TikTok thing for a second here. Right. Um, I mean, how how does that work? I mean, in terms of uh, I mean, is there a level of monetization that goes on with it? Is it is it just doing it for gets and shiggles or? Okay, so there is a little bit of money that can be made, um, and that's there. There's there are several different ways you can do this. So. There is a TikTok creator fund. So once you reach a certain amount of followers, I believe it's, uh, I can't remember whether it's 50,000 or 100,000 followers. Once you reach a certain level, um, they will pay you for your content. So in other words, it all depends on the number of streams that you get. So the number of views that you get, how active your videos are. So if you have a video that goes viral, um, and stays viral for a while, you know, you could make a couple bucks a day. Um, you know, sometimes I've, I've made upwards of 20 bucks a day. Sometimes it's five cents a day. Yeah. But um, there is a rolling count that goes and it's not, you're not going to get rich off of the creative fund, creator fund necessarily. I mean, unless you have millions and millions of followers and you are creating content and posting three or four videos a day, perhaps you could make some, some decent money per month. Um, but it's, again, it's going to be sort of a side hustle. Um, so there is that. Um, there's also something that's called, um, what do they call it? Um, 
it's not the creative fund, uh, um, marketplace, creative marketplace. So what that is, is that companies can reach out to you uh, to promote their product. And if you do a video, they'll offer you a contract. Now you can state in there what your opening bid is and whether or not it's a sliding scale or if you are if you wanna negotiate the price. Um, and so there, that's where your real, that's where your big money can be made. Um, however, that doesn't really happen until you get to, you know, 500,000, a million followers, because right. now you're really going to be seen by a lot of people. Right. And companies are not going to offer you a, a ton of money until you get to that level. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that. Um, the other way is that companies can reach out outside of that. So I actually had Pixar reach out to me before the soul movie came out. Okay. And they offered me a decent, a pretty decent buyout to do one video and it was duetting. Um, and if you don't know what duetting is, I'll explain that too. It was duetting John Baptiste um, and um, Quest Love and a couple of the other artists from the movie. And it was like a 60 second video and they offered, you know, whatever this fee um, and I was like, yeah, okay, great. I'll do it. Then they asked me, well, do you know any trombone players that have a presence on TikTok? It's like, sure. So I, you know, um, recommended some people. And then at the last minute, Disney decided to go another direction and said, we're not doing it. Uh, so that happens and yeah. it happens. And, 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 you know, it's happened with a couple of other companies, some some lesser known companies um, and things fall fall to the wayside or wherever they change and they go a different direction yeah. or whatever. Um, so there's that opportunity as well. And that's just from being seen mm -hmm. out there. You know, um, I've had a couple sponsors. So there's like the, the this company here, the coldest water. Um, that's a sponsor that I got through TikTok. So if you, if you enter promo code Trump hashtag trumpet man, when you purchase that, I get kickbacks, I get like an 8% on whatever you purchase. And so there's, there are things like that that happen as well on TikTok. So, you know, if you put it all together and, 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 and work it the right way, yeah, you could, you could do okay. Yeah. You know, not going to replace your gigs. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, the way the duets work is that you can basically duet anybody. So if somebody lays down a guitar part and they're playing whatever, an original song, um, there is an option on there that you can just hit duet. And so that it split screens and then it has their, their audio and their video and then you're next to it. And then for me, I pumped my entire studio to my iPhone through an, an interface. So I have my, my Apollo twin interface. Then I do the out and I go to an iRig. My iRig goes to my phone. And basically my entire recording studio is now my audio in to my phone. So I'm getting super high quality audio sent to TikTok. Okay. And then you just hit the record button and they play, you can hear them and you basically are having a session without them even knowing it. And then you post that video, you can tag them in it, you can hashtag things. And if you play your cards right, boom, it explodes and then people will can duet that. And so I've done ones where I've laid down one trumpet track or two, and then people have added trombone, barry, tenor, alto, and then you, suddenly you have this virtual horn section without ever asking for it. No, that's nuts. It's really cool, man. And there are some amazing amazing young talented artists out there that if it weren't for tiktok you would never have heard of them yeah yeah well that's cool i mean and i know like you know the, the whole thing like monetization and, and sponsorships and stuff like that trust me man i mean that, i'm dealing with that on on trying to do this with the podcast because you yeah, know sure. it's yeah it's a lot of work and they're um you know how, how do you how do you make it worth the effort and uh, you know, the, the amount of time that, that goes into it and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm trying to, to hash out. So anybody listening, if, if you want to sponsor this podcast, uh, I certainly will, will not say no. Um, uh, I'll even take barter. So if you, uh, if, if you maybe distill, I'm having rum today. So if you distill uh, fine spirits, uh, you know, 
hamburger you know, steaks, whatever. I, I really like Polar Seltzer. Polar Seltzer, if you're out there, sponsor this man. Sponsor me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I've gotten into the seltzer kick, man. Me too. Uh, just actually, my, my, my wife kind of got me started on it because she just, uh, she always just drinks sparkling water whenever we go out. You know, she always gets like, you know, Pellegrino or something like that. And uh, we started to, uh, we shop at Wagman's. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. So if you're not familiar with Wagman's, uh, they've got really good flavored sparkling waters. Is this the Wegmans brand? The Wegmans brand. No kidding. All right. Yes, and it's it's you know decent price. So uh, the Wegmans ginger and the uh, cherry vanilla. Those are like two of our favorites. Okay. Uh, have you tried the San Pellegrino? Oh yes. Oh, that is. Yes. It's, it's pricey, but boy, I tell you. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, when those, when, those bubbles are something special. Yeah, when when I make those J Web dollars, I'll uh, <laughs> I'll I'll do that. I'll do that. So, uh, you know, I, I gotta gotta keep it keep it light these days, man. You know, you know how it goes. Yeah, you know, and I I wore this shirt just uh just for you, uh, just a little oh, that is, uh, little. That is that is a Doc Severinsen approved. Yes, shirt. Doc Doc and J both uh. I approve. All right. That's good. I have, a, I have flowers on mine. You just can't really see them on the video, but it's very subtle. I usually wear this with a very loud jacket over top of it, perhaps with some sequins or, you know, purple flowers, something. I just, I wanted to tone it down a little bit. You know I, what I mean? Yeah. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. <laughs> I'm not sure the camera would be able to, to, uh, to handle that. Yellow jacket. I wanted to stay away from the yellow jacket. Too much. It's just way too much. So um, let, let's talk about like kind of the, the pre-COVID world for a moment, uh, going back in time. You um, you were working with a lot of really hip people. Um, and I think maybe maybe one of the, the coolest gigs that you had in terms of uh, my book these days uh, was uh, working with, with Corey Wong. Yeah. That was, um, yeah, that was a surprise. I actually, I got that call while I was on tour um, and I, I'll never forget it. I was in the dressing room. I, I don't remember where we were, but um, I got this text and it says, you know, a, a list of dates for summer concerts, you know, um, these summer jams. And, and I thought, you know, jam band scene. And I said, oh, I don't know. So I, I, I go to the guitar player. I was like, hey, um, Dave Sikwagrana is his name. Great guitar player uh, based out of New York, New Jersey. Um, and I said, you ever heard of this guy, Corey Wong? <laughs> He's like, take the gig. That's all he said. <laughs> I was like, really? He's like, dude, take the gig. I'm like, oh, okay. He's like, go check out his stuff. So, of course, I pull it up. And here I, I'm listening to the Hornheads, who I have been, I admired my entire, like, college career. Right. Michael B. Nelson's doing all these arrangements and this stuff is just so hip. And I'm like, Oh man. All right, cool. This is cool. So yeah. So I, I got the call to do that. And I did, I started off doing, it was like the summer prior to, or the year before that I was doing um, a couple of jam band things, you know, uh, I forget where we did one up in upstate New York, um, Ohio. It's like these little drive out things. We did one in Scranton. And then um, it was so much fun, I got to tell you. And and Corey's great. He's so so down to earth and so talented, um, like just just a genius um, as far as just uh, his playing, his writing, um, and also his promoting skills. I've he is a beast. I've never seen anyone work it like Corey Wong. It's just unbelievable. So. Um, so yeah, so I did I did this like a little bit of a summer tour, and then when he started his U.S. tour, um, the following I think it was like in the spring because we we were out in the Midwest. We started in Kansas City, and we we drove through this ice storm, man. That I thought I was like this this car is going to freeze over. I mean, we had to get out and chip the ice off the front of the car at one point, um, and we were in Kansas City, uh, so we were out in the Midwest, and man, the his audiences, the band the vibe, the challenging horn writing of Michael B. Nelson. It's one of the more challenging gigs I've ever had to do, but also the most rewarding and fun. And Corey just 
he opens things up. You can just, you know, solo. He'll call and it and it's just so unexpected. He'll be in the middle of a jam and he'll just go, J Webb. J Webb. And you're like, oh God, we're in we're in we're in B. This is awesome. <laughs> and it's like, you know, 260. Great. And it's gonna get faster every time we have a break. Great, cool. You know, so it kept you on your toes. You got a challenging horn arrangements, great bunch of guys on the band. Man, it was it was an absolute blast. Man, yeah, it sounds like a fun gig. Oh. Uh, yeah. So when you were um I, I've seen I've seen some videos of you of uh, you know, like some of your live streams and stuff like that. Uh you kind of got into the electronics a little bit. I have. And actually, these guys a little promoting pedal pad. So yeah, I got into, and also a shout out to horn effects. Um, those guys really, so between horn effects and pedal pad, uh, I started getting, getting into, uh, guitar pedals. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get into pedals, um, for a very long time. I sort of dabbled a little bit in, into like some whammy wah pedals for a while years ago. And, you know, I was always a Randy Brecker fan and, mm -hmm. and, um, so I, um, I hit up horn effects and I said, um, I said, you know, uh, Doug Levin and Aaron, uh, Janik are the guys over there. And, um, I said, I, I want to learn a little bit more about routing and, and how, and what's the best way for horn players to set up a rig. Those guys have, they have it dialed in. I mean, you know, they really helped with the way that you route the pedals and, and understanding how the signal works and whatnot. So, and then I met the guys at pedal pad and they built me this custom <laughs> custom. I wish I could lift it up and show you, man, this custom alligator printed wrapped pedal board. And in the front of it has the doc severance and tribute band logo that lights up in leds. Damn dude. It is by far. I mean, it's, it's, I am so grateful for these guys um, and everything's contained. So basically all my power and XLRs are external on the box. So when I show up to a gig, I open up the lid, I plug in the XLRs from the, from the, uh, from the board. I hit my power and I pop the switch on and I'm ready to roll. Everything's in there. The guys also bought a great pedal from, um, from Zorg called the Zorg blow. That's um, made over in, I think it's France, and it's basically an, an interface so that it has phantom power built in, and it's a pedal. So you don't need you don't need anything from anybody. You show up with your rig, you got phantom power, you've got an interface, you got everything you need. Only thing you need is an XLR and power, and you are ready to go. And that's set up in my studio. I use it um, to do some funk when I'm doing some funky stuff. Um, I got a whammy wah, um, a harmonist pedal, distortion, the EQ, of course, um, the digital reverb and delay, and then um, the Zorg Blow, which basically powers everything. Um, and yeah, so, and then I, if I run that through GarageBand, I can tap into the GarageBand pedals as well and sort of, you know, add on to that, the pedal board through there as well. So, right. It's fun, man. You can do a lot of crazy stuff and blow some young people's minds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're pretty cool for an old guy there, Jay. I, that's what I'm, they're like, oh, my God. I don't know how many times I'm on TikTok. They're like, how old are you? And I go, or how long have you been playing? I go, most of my life. <laughs> and that's all you need to know. <laughs> That's it. Or, or you can just go the other way and go, uh, I just kind of like started a few months ago. Is this good? Am I sounding okay to yeah. everyone? <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's a little side, a hobby of mine that, um, I, I really enjoy. I enjoy it. It's a lot. It's, you know, I have the time, but that was the thing was like, I never had the time to dial in these pedals and to mess with them when, you know, pandemic, what are you going to do? You're going to find things to do and experiment with. And that was one of the things that I really got into. And 
And uh, I mean, I still, I still don't have it dialed in, but you know, it's getting there. I'm, I'm having fun. And that's really, that's all, that's all that matters really, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> oh, absolutely. I mean, and, and you know, you, you're going about the right way, kind of getting the pro set up because I like for myself, I mean, I don't, I don't use effects. I, I played around with them years ago, uh, but I just didn't have the money to invest in, in anything decent at the time. But uh, just like putting together my, my wireless rack for, uh, for my in-ears and, and wireless microphones and stuff like that, the first thing I did was I talked to a sound man that I work with yeah, regularly. You know, like he, he ran sound for one of the bands I played with. I'm like, dude, I'm putting this rack together. Tell me what I need. And not just in terms of, of what brand, but just like tell me what I need and help me to put it together. And yeah. so, you know, just everything was put together, patch bays, everything. So it's just, here's a send to go to the board. Here's my, my AC and, you know, I and I even have it set up so that if they don't have aux sends to send to my in-ears, I can just run a split off of, you know, XLR split into my, my ears and I don't have to worry about anything or anybody. I'm just, I'm self-contained. And sound men appreciate that because they just have to give you a cable. So much better. Oh yeah. Just, and the, the, the less they have to do, the better. Yeah. The more, the more they love you, the, the less you have to do, you know, it's, it, that's right. Yeah, it's like always be nice to the sound man, buy him a drink. You know, or, <laughs> well, of course, most of them are not drinking because they drank too much when they were younger. So I, I'm glad you said it. I didn't say it. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> But just be nice to it, that lesson number one. If you're in a gigging band, if you're a young musician, be nice to your sound man. Oh yeah, absolutely, because they can make your life a nightmare, and you don't even know it sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, trust yeah, me. Not, and that's what the guys at Horn Effects did. Basically, it said, you know, what I have these pedals. How do I route it? What do I do? You know. So, yeah. Shout out to them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would be interested to um, to play around with using that, like you're like you're saying, using it with GarageBand, but to uh, to have virtual virtual instruments on stage. And I always wanted to you know play around with like um, that Ewe or EV, um, and play around yeah. with those a little bit. But uh, you know, again, that's that's a little salty for. Yeah, the, 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 I've I've tried and attempted to play EV, and I just my brain does not have the capacity to know where to shift, and I'm just like, nah, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> I can't even play a major scale on this thing. I'm out. Yeah, <laughs> I can't play major scale on a trumpet, so it makes it even. <laughs> <laughs> Got to use the third valve. Once you get, once you start using that, man, it's just too confusing yeah yeah third valve no no like, like ukulele I, I could figure out ukulele but as soon as you add one or two more strings i'm done i'm out <laughs> yeah well you know we, we all have a cross to bear jay so yeah, it, yeah. that's just one of them so uh on those uh on those wonderful videos you've been doing uh you've been doing uh the arrangements on those man you got some hip stuff going on with those too so oh, so, uh, have and you feel like your your arranging chops are getting better after all of this work? I got to tell you, man. Um, I never ever considered myself an arranger or a writer. I've written one original tune my entire career, and it's on an album that no one will ever hear. Uh, it was it was it used to be featured on the Weather Channel on local on the eights years and years and years ago, and then it just sort of died off whatever it just disappeared and um you know i just it wasn't something that i was passionate about um you know i was never really schooled in theory and arranging and i and i i left college before i really got into that sort of those classes and things like that so i just you know i left school for a gig um and i thought you know that's that's fine i'm i'm okay with that i'm not i'm not an arranger um and then so fast forward to to now currently and i'm doing like i said i'm doing more recording but i'm also doing more writing and arranging than i ever have and it's and the way that i do it is and it's funny because people always say hey can i get can i get that chart can i get the sheet music and i go if i had it i'd give it to you 
because I don't write anything down. Okay. I play everything into GarageBand or Logic, and I just I layer everything. Mm -hmm. So I I play because for me, when an idea pops in my head, if I don't get it down immediately, I lose it. If I try to write it out, I forget what it is. So most people will sing it into a recorder or, or a you know voice recorder or whatever on their phone, but for me creatively, I create better on the horn. So when I have it in my hands and I'm and I'm hearing the music and I play a line that I hear in my head, I just get it directly down into GarageBand. Now it can be really rough; it's like a sketch, but then I'll create another track below that, and I will double that. And if there's any gaps or any mistakes, I'll fix it. And then if I'm if I'm happy with that idea, I'll leave it and then I'll clean it up. However, most of the time I have multiple ideas, mm -hmm. so I'll leave that track there and, and I'll go okay, and I'm gonna I'll mute that track, then I'll create another one, or I'll just create a bunch of tracks to, to start. I'll go to the next track, and then I'll play another idea in, and then I repeat the same process. Um, then once I decide, you know, okay, I really, really like the way that this sounds and the way it lays, then I go with that. Then I go to the next part. I go, okay, now I have to add harmony. What am I going to do here? So then I add the harmony part. Then I'll add a third part. Then I'll add a fourth. Then I'll do the octaves. And then uh, I'll also, if I feel like there's gaps, I'll add like maybe a separate line, um, a counter melody of some kind. And then I'll blend the two of them together. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, then I you know, I scrap one or I, you know, edit something else, but that's, that's how I've arranged. I'm, I've gotten, so have I gotten better at it? Yes. I've gotten a lot quicker. Um, just as far as like editing and knowing how to do that and the keystrokes and, and garage band and knowing how to do all of that, setting the levels. Um, but you know, I just, the way that my brain works, I have too many ideas coming at me at once and I can't, I don't have time to write it down. Because yeah. if I write it down, it's gone forever. And, yeah. and, and, and some of it, I'm, I get frustrated when I have an idea and then it just disappears because I can't get it back. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's a little bit unorthodox, but I'm not the only person that works that way. No, I actually, I work that way. I'm pretty similar. I'm pretty similar in terms of that. So uh, uh, my good friend, Phil Lasseter, who's, you know, great arranger, horn, horn player, horn arranger, and, um, he does the same thing. He just stacks stuff and moves on, you know, cleans it up or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. He really I mean, doesn't write anything out. I, now, yeah, you, you got, of course, you know, who the person I consider to be like the, the, the king of all horn arrangers is Jerry Hay. Right. And Jerry, but Jerry, I mean, Jerry has perfect pitch. So Jerry hears it and can write it. Just, you know, th there, there is no, transcribing or transposing it it's just you know, it comes from here and it just comes right out i can't do that you know i couldn't sit down and voice something out you know just on the fly so for me it's it's like it's get that idea and figure out how to get it on to used to be on tape i used to do that with with cassettes man in the old wow. days I, yeah, would have, I would have i would have two cassette players you know, because I didn't have multi, I didn't have multi track. You know, I had these yeah. old sil uh, Sears Silvertone <laughs> cassette yeah, players, and I I would record one. You know, I, I'd have like a you know a recording of of the band or whatever going on, and then I I play down my track, and then I flip that tape over to the other one, and you know I just I'd just be going back and forth recording over, and of course it sounded like complete ass by the time you got got close to anything, but you know that was just the way of 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 getting everything together and getting the ideas together, and then I you know would would write them down and and pass them out, but yeah that that was the only way because I couldn't hear. I mean, I could hear in my head what I wanted to have happen, but I couldn't always translate what I heard in my head to the paper, but I could always translate it to tape. Right. You know, and then once it was on tape, then it was go back and pick out the part if I need to write it out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that, you know, I haven't had to write any of this out because I've, when it's, when it ends up going on an album, they're just using all of my stacked parts. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm usually do the lower voices on flugelhorn. And then I do the uppers on trumpet and I just stack it that way where it sounds, you know, like a horn section. Um, 
So, I mean, if, and if they wanted to add sacks, they could have somebody transcribe it. But I, I just, you know, I've had people offer to transcribe my charts and whatever. I'm like, sure, go ahead. <laughs> Help yourself. No, I'm, not gonna do it. No, I'm not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> if you want it, you got to get somebody else to do it. Exactly. Cause I gotta, I gotta move on and I gotta, I gotta do the next project, you know, like, so it's just, it's just how I work. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Hey, it's working for you. So that's all that really matters now. Oh man. So, um, you're still, uh, hoping that, that, uh, the, the symphony gigs open up again or, uh, I mean, I'm just, I'm hoping that, yeah. Um, that I get an opportunity to go, to go back there. I, I love working with the NSO. Um, you know, it was so much fun playing with it, with that orchestra and, and in that hall and, and the guys are great, you know, um, you know, just very welcoming community there at the NSO. And, and, uh, man, I really, really hope to get back there soon. We'll yeah. see what happens. Well, I mean, and that's, you know, you, you have, like I, we we're talking about earlier, you know, you had a, a very varied career, uh, you know, you, you're working with the NSO, working with people like Corey Wong, doing the, um, you know, the the doo wop stuff. Uh, you know, you, you you pretty much have have run the whole the whole gamut. Uh, you the was it the eight bit band? Eight bit big band. Eight yeah. bit big band. So you had all these things going on. I mean, what's your uh, what's your favorite? Um, God, it, it's it's really hard to put to put. Uh, them in in favorite order um you know i think one of the highlights of my career obviously has to be the nso um you know that was just it's something that early on uh playing in, in college thinking that you know okay maybe i'll get an orchestral gig you know, and, and, or when you're in all state orchestra and all state wind ensemble, you're thinking, oh yeah, this is good. One day I'm going to be playing with a symphony, you know, and then, and then reality hits you and you're like, uh, that's probably not going to happen. And that's fine. You know, I'm, I'm still having a successful career and, and, and I'm, and I'm playing and I'm having opportunities. And then that opportunity comes up and you're like, oh, wow. Okay. This is going to happen. And, um, so that certainly was, you know, one of the most memorable, gigs that I, that I've ever had in my career. It was, it was really, really special. Um, but my, God, my favorite, Oh, I mean, I love playing funk. Yeah. You know, I love just, just the groove, the pocket and being able to just, you know, uh, when you're in a great horn section and things are, are really tight and together and, and, and the intonation is just there. And it's so good that you play a note and you just, you look at each other and you just laugh because it's it, because it's that good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't think this is anything better than that, you know? And when that happens repeatedly on the same gig and you just have an evening where it's, it's so good that you just do nothing but laugh about it, man, the, those moments are really, those are the special ones, you know? And, um, and that primarily happens on pop or funk gigs, you know, and, and there are big band gigs where it happens too, when you're in a great trumpet section, you know, but my favorite thing, honestly, is when the trumpet is on my face, period. I don't care what I'm playing, yeah. uh, to be honest with you. It doesn't matter. I could be playing an Easter gig at church. As long as the horns on my face, I don't care. You're good. I'm good. I'm happy. I'm in my, I'm in my happy place. I'm, I'm, I'm in my space. That that's, that's my wheelhouse, man. Whatever it is, trumpet. I don't care what it is. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's a good one. You know, uh, you know, so many people get caught up in the, um, you know, the, the, what they're doing as opposed to the why they do it. You know, it's like, you know, not, I'm not happy unless I have this specific gig or I'm playing this specific kind of music as opposed to, you know, I get to play, you know, yeah. and you yeah. get to do something you love. And if you get paid for it, man, that's bonus. Right. And I think, I think the trap that so many of us can fall into is, is, is you're always, you're, ch you're forever chasing the perfect gig or your gig, you know, well, y you, you, you have to think about living in the moment 
what's what where are you right now and and enjoying that moment of hey you've got this opportunity to to play the instrument that you love and that you enjoy doing whatever it is whatever genre whatever style um but think about that moment that you have with the next gig that you're in is it with the best band possible maybe not is it the is it the style of music that you want to play maybe it's not but you're still playing you're still creating you're still playing your instrument why not enjoy the moment yeah you know don't because if you think about, ah, I hate this gig, I'm on this gig, it's terrible, and I, I wish I was playing a jazz gig tonight and playing some straight ahead. Okay, well, you're not tonight. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah, exactly. He's going to be all right. You're yeah. still playing, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I prefer to be eating a steak right now, but I'm not, so, you know, yeah. but... I have to eat this taco, but the taco is still pretty good. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I'm hungry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's crazy, man. It is absolutely crazy. You know, so um, I just want to ask you this question, and, and it's going to be a two-parter. So, okay. and and it's going to kind of tie into you know what's been kind of the main theme tonight. A lot of the, like the stuff we've been doing, like TikTok and that sort of stuff. Um, but you know, we've got obviously uh, you know changes in technology, whether it be. Uh, social media, you know, the way that that information can, can get disseminated, uh, recording technology, uh, being able to record remotely. You have things like, you know, effects processors and all, all those wonderful things that have been going on in terms of technology over the past, you know, few years. Um, and then obviously we have like two main camps of players. We have the young, the novice player, and then we have the older experienced player. Um so if you had to give a piece of advice to a younger player in terms of the things that they should be uh, looking at and embracing in terms of the way that technology and music integrate, what would it be? And then conversely, if you're you know sitting down with a, an old dog and saying, you know, hey, dude, these are the things that you really need to start looking at and learning to embrace if you want to keep your career fresh and moving on, what would that be? Um, well, I mean, first thing that comes to mind, I think would just be, uh, I think the same conversation could be applied to both players. Um, because yes, the, the younger generation knows how to use the technology perhaps, um, but isn't sure of what content to provide um, if that makes sense. Yeah. So absolutely. I think maybe th the difference between the two of them. So the younger player, I would say, you know, um, do, you know, you know how to run the technology. Um, obviously there's so much information out there. You, you can find out in one, a couple of keystrokes how to do something. Um, but I would say as a, as a player, a young player is to just, Post things and record things that you're passionate about and not don't try to impress people with what you're doing. Just be you. Do what you want to do. And if you put in and your the passion and the heart into what you're doing, it will get noticed. You will get you will get feedback. You will get things. Um, in return. So I would say, you know, I, I guess in layman's term, it's like, don't be a show off. Don't go into it to that. Don't go into social media going, I'm going to be a social media star and I'm going to play these high notes and I'm going to do all this stuff and I want to be noticed. There are millions of people doing that same exact thing. Mm -hmm. and they are the guys that go, why don't my videos get any views? Look at how high I'm playing. Why isn't anybody paying attention to me? Because you're pushing it too hard and you're doing everything that everyone else is doing. Just listen to your heart, listen to your gut and do what makes you happy. Do what you're passionate about. If you want to duet a video and play a ballad on flugelhorn and it's 
to some obscure artist that no one heard of, but you really enjoy it, do that because people will connect to you because of, you're putting your heart and soul into it. So that would be the advice I would give that the younger person. Um, the more seasoned uh, musician, I would say, you know, the, the technology, um, you know, uh, as far as what I guess, so the way that I approach it was basically like very similar. And I guess it goes back to what I was saying before is, as I would say that I would have the same message for, for both, you know, again, um, for me, it was, I have nothing to prove. I'm just going to go on here. I'm going to figure out the technology and I'm going to do what I want to do. And if people like that, then they like it. Cool. You know, I, it's not, it's really not all that deep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that answer your question? <laughs> if it doesn't, I want my money back. So anyway, um, well, we're going to, uh, we've got two final segments we're going to deal with tonight. Uh, so the first one is, uh, where we get to talk about gear. This is our geared up section. And uh, we're going to talk about gear. what Jay is using besides his pedals. <laughs> well, I should start off with the brand new um, custom Adams F5. Ooh. The gold plated brushed finish copper bell F5 with a high polish inner gold bell mm. with the emerald abalone finger buttons which is my birthstone emeralds um and then i'm using a curry f flugel or three fl flugel mouthpiece mm -hmm. uh, this horn is absolutely gorgeous I, and i gotta do it i gotta give a shit out, shout out to uh austin custom brass and and trent and josh um they hooked me up uh, through Adams and, um, helped me build this horn. And it's absolutely, it's amazing. Yeah. It, I got, I, I have to say that it's the first horn I've ever owned where you just breathe into it and it plays itself. It's the response is just, it's unbelievable. It's such a great horn. Yeah. So well. that's the first new toy. Mm, that's a beauty. That's a beauty. Yeah, Adams makes some great gear, man. Absolutely. I've, I've wanted an Adams Flugel for years, and I, I borrowed one at an ITG to play. Um, when we had it in Philly, we did a big band thing with with Wayne Bergeron and and uh, and um, who else was there? Uh, George Rabbi. We had a bunch of guests come in, and, and I I was like, hey, can I can I play this tonight? And I just ever since then I fell in love with it. So now I finally have my own. It's amazing. Um, the other flugel that I use is actually the, the Austin Custom Brass Flugel, the doubler. Mm -hmm. And if you follow the link on my TikTok, it has been, it's called the As Seen on TikTok Trumpet Man Flugel Horn Doubler. Oh, okay. Oh, that link. Check that out. That's also a great horn and very um, affordable. It's like just under 700 bucks. And it, yeah. it play, I'm telling you, I used it on a ton of, of TikTok videos and it's that also plays beautifully and you can't beat the price. It's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. Anybody looking to get their feet wet on a flugelhorn, check out Austin Custom Brass. It's it's killer. Yeah. Trent Trent has great gear. He really does. And yep. I mean and the, the thing I love about Trent is that, you know, he also will just, you know, if he will take the time to talk to you and, and help you out and, and just be completely honest with you, but uh also yeah. very entertaining. Oh yeah. Yeah. He's a funny dude. Oh yeah. I love Trent. Great dude. Um, so next is the, is just my Eterna gets in Piccolo mm. little baby and nothing fancy here. Just a, a, a three C coronet mouthpiece, whatever. It gets the job done. <laughs> yeah. No high compression piece on that. No. And I, I've used this on Broadway. I've used it on, on book of Mormon and it's, it's great. It does the job. It's perfect. Um, so there's that. And then my B flat is still my, my Yamaha uh, 8310Z. 
Um, and surprising enough, yet again, another Bach 3C. And I just play, I play everything on one mouthpiece. I know people think that's crazy, but you know, we're all different. We're all built differently. Everyone's jaws, teeth, lips, anatomy, everybody's different. So what works for me might not work for everybody. That's just how we are. But yeah, it's just a Bach, a standard Bach 3C. Um, here I have the black opal finger buttons by Divot Trumpets. Ooh. Got some finger buttons there. But um, other than that, some, some stock gear right there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And well. my recording gear is the Universal Audio Apollo Twin X interface. Um, I use Logic or GarageBand, MacBook Pro. I have two different iRigs for my uh, TikToks or lives anytime I do that. Um, and then I, I earlier talked about Pedal Pad, who built my guitar pedal pad for me. And then Horn Effects helped me with the routing of the pedals and 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 Zorg with their uh, interface pedal. I mean, that's, I'm trying to think of anything else. Um, all my custom alligator uh, case from Torpedo Bag, of course. That's yeah. one of my favorite. You gotta yeah. love those guys. I love Steve and cats over there. Yeah. Well, yeah, I saw that bag. It's a great looking bag. <laughs> the green alligator, baby. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if it disappears, I'm not saying that it might be in Lancaster, but it might be in <laughs> Lancaster. Uh I have a tracking device in there, but I won't tell you where it's located. Okay. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's cool. So um with with that Adams. What is it that attracted you? I mean, you, you said that you know you played you played in Adams before, but but when you're designing it, I guess that'd be the, the question I really wanted to ask. So when you're designing it, what were you looking for in that horn that you couldn't get anywhere else? Okay, so that's a great question because because I play so many different styles. Um, you know, I use a fluke horn for. On Broadway, I use it in a big band. I also use it as a soloist. So I needed something that had, as to quote my great friend, George Rabbi, I needed something that had the fluff, the warmness, the dark colors. Um, that I mean, there's no, there's no better word than the fluff. That's what I wanted. Um, but I also wanted it to be able to soar in the upper register and play double A's on it if I wanted to. Um, and just be able to just get up there and have great intonation in the upper register, not be squirrely, but also be able to manipulate the sound. So if I wanted to pitch bend on a double G and slide down to something, I wanted to be able to have that flexibility. So I called Trent and, and, and Josh and, and I, I said, listen, this is what I want. Um, this is what I needed to do. And they they just went with it. They said, okay, you're going to need, you know, the copper bell, the F5 definitely is, is where you want to go. And I don't know all the specs to the F5, but you know, I basically said, this is what I wanted to do. What do I need to do to get there? And those guys just, they just ran with it. They said, okay, boom, 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 boom. What do you want it to look like? What kind of finish? And for me, I have extremely acidic hands. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that if anything lacquer, I just eat right through it. Yeah, me too. Which is why my my B flat is silver. I prefer it not to be silver, but other, I'd be buying a horn every five years. So um, so I wanted something that wasn't going to deteriorate in my hands and just in six months start to show wear. So that's why I went with the gold plating because I knew that it would withstand my acid hands. Um, but yeah. I, I really love the horn. It's it's it does exactly what I asked them and what I wanted it to do. That's cool. It's great when that happens. Yeah. All right. Well, we've got one last segment to get through. This is our All right. Final segment. All right. This is our. Uh, Rob- is this the speed round? This is the Robinson's Remedy Rapid Fire Round. Brought to us by our good friends, Robinson's Remedies, Kenny Robinson and Richard McCamall. Thanks, guys, for uh, for your support of the show. And, uh, you know, if you need to give your chops a little extra love, check them out. Keep you fresh on the gig. I it, need that stuff. Yeah, it's, it's good stuff, man. Yep. It, 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 it's like, what did, I, I, Walter White said something like, it's, it's, it's like eight measures of rest in a bottle. 
I'll tell you what, between when you got a matinee and you got an evening show, it's it's like resting your chops for a day in yeah. between shows. Yep, absolutely. Good stuff. Uh, not as good as a bottle of bourbon, but uh, it, it's close. So... <laughs> So uh, we we have uh, some different questions than than the uh, the time that that we first did uh, the, oh, the original version, but uh, so some of them might be the same, but but we'll see what your right. answers are now. All uh, right, here we go, Mr. J Webb. Fast as you can, give me the answers to these questions. First one: Who's the biggest influence on your life that is not a trumpet player? Oh man, it has to be my dad. All right. Although he is a trumpet player, but not professionally. Still counts. Okay, still counts. All right. <laughs> Technicalities. All right. Uh, what's your favorite book? Oh, uh, that would have to be Stillness is the Key. Mm, okay. Just started getting into that. Mm, okay. Uh, what's the worst movie you've ever seen? Oh, man. Um, oh, man. What is the name of that? Okay, worst movie I've ever seen in my entire life, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. <laughs> it was the soundtrack. <laughs> yeah, that was... Which was, you know, who did the soundtrack for that? No, I don't. Gordon Goodwin. <laughs> of course. Uh, I love the soundtrack, Gordon. Great yeah. stuff. Good movie stuff. was horrible. Yeah, the movie was horrible, Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> you you got to start somewhere. Um if you uh, weren't a trumpet player, what would you want to be? Um, a carpenter. Hmm. If you had a hammer, would you hammer in the morning? Maybe in the evening. Okay. All over the land. Okay. <laughs> What's your favorite drink? Hendrix gin. I thought you were going to say polar seltzer. <laughs> But Hendrix gin chilled. I don't want any vermouth or olives. Please don't don't put that in my gin. Yep, there you go. That's the way to do it. All right, uh, Jay, you're going to uh, be able to have a a dinner party, and you can invite any three living people, any three people in the world today. Who would you invite? Oof, man. Um, of course, they're going to be musicians. Um, it would be. The great Larry McKenna, Warren Vachey, uh, of course they're all trumpet, you know, well musicians. Oh man, this is this is this is this is a tough one. Can picture them all at the table at once. Bobby Shue. Okay. That would be some interesting conversation. Uh yes, it would. Uh, you have three additional chairs at that table and you can invite any three people from history. Oh, um, Maurice Andre. Uh, uh, Louis Armstrong and Louis Prima. Ah, oh, man, a lot of trumpet playing going on. I know. Well, these are all people I'd want to sit down with. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I, I think I already know the quest, the answer to this question. Lacquer plated or raw? Ah, uh, yeah. Got to have the gold plating. Got to go gold. I, I'm waiting for you to go with uh, the uh, the platinum plating. Oh, is that a thing yet? Yeah, well, you know. Um. You can work on that. XITG, someone will have it. Yeah. <laughs> you got to get blinged out, man. All right. Uh, what's your favorite quote? Um, easy. Another trumpet playing quote. But one of my favorite quotes of all time is, space can swing too. Mm. Want to know who said that? Who said that? George Rabbi. Oh. I love George, man. Yeah. Dude, talk about fluff. I mean, and, I, and I'm saying that in the in the the, the nicest way possible. Man, his flugel sound is just uh, 
Butter. Yep. Butter, for sure. Um, okay, what is your greatest fear? Uh, not being able to perform. Mm-hmm. All right, you could be granted one superpower. What would it be? Flight. All right. Uh, what aspect of trumpet playing do you feel is the most overrated? Oh, overrated. Uh, no. High notes. High notes. Just, just, I'm not going to say lead playing. I'm just going to say upper register. Yeah. Yeah. All right. What aspect of trumpet playing do you feel is the most underrated? Tone quality. All right. You're granted the ability to go back in time and give yourself, your younger self, one piece of advice about music. What would it be? Ooh. Um, I would say spend less time on the horn and more time on the books. Okay. And uh, you can give yourself uh, one piece of advice about life. Oh, well, that's going to go back to an earlier thing is, is um, enjoy the moments as they're happening and spend less time thinking about the future and what's to come later. Just be in the moment. Okay, cool. And the final question, what do you want your legacy to be? Oh, man. Really? That's where we're going? That's where we're going. <laughs> um, <clears throat> basically, when I, when, I, when I depart from this, from this life form, life force, uh, I would want to be known or remembered as one of the best all around trumpeters to be on this planet. That's always been my goal. Mm-hmm. Well, your acumen is uh, giving some credence to that because you, you certainly are uh, one of the most well-rounded uh, players I know. I mean, there are a lot of guys that can do a lot of different things, but that doesn't necessarily mean they can do them all at a high level, and you certainly can. And, I, um, you know, I appreciate that very much. Thank you, man. It means a lot. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm just bucking for that fourth trumpet book. So <laughs> you got it. Yeah, I think your son's already got dibs on that, so I might have to go up to third <laughs> trumpet. So. Uh, but it has been an absolute pleasure to catch up with you, my friend. Um, you know, it's it's so funny that we, we only live, you know, what, about an hour and a half or so away from each other. Not and, even. And, uh, you know, we haven't seen each other for, for well over a year. And I'm just looking forward to being able to get together again and uh, hopefully you can come to Lancaster and we can go to that same restaurant that we went to the last time you were here. I would love to do that. Have that, uh, that grilled chicken Caesar or grilled steak Caesar salad. Yep. yep. I'm down. I right. am down. Whenever you're ready, they are open. They are now, uh, they are now seating indoors. So whenever you feel up for a little road trip, my friend, you're always welcome have to make some plans absolutely thanks man we Appreciate got it all right well thanks for taking time with me uh to hang and for all of my listeners out there i hope that you really uh picked up on some some cool advice from jay the master himself on uh on how to uh maximize your social media presence and uh some great tips on on uh trumpet and life so thanks for hanging out with us and as always Peace and slide grease. Wee's out. Hey, thank you so much for hanging with us today. This podcast is all about creating connection through our mutual love for the trumpet life. 
I hope that you learned a few things about today's guest and had some laughs along the way. Don't forget to give us a review. We love those five-star ratings. And please share this podcast with your friends. We want to see our hang grow for show. Have a suggestion for a future topic or a guest? Hit me up at thetrumpetgurus at gmail.com. Our opening theme was written and performed by Lexi Signor, and all other music comes courtesy of The Greatest Funeral Ever. So in the words of W.C. Handy, life is like a trumpet. If you don't put anything into it, you don't get anything out. So go out there and let your trumpet sound, and I'll see you at the next hang.